Welcome to Sector Head Spotlight. This week, I have the great company of our industrial sector head, Jay Van Skyver, with us today. Thank you, sir, for joining. I uh, appreciate it. And for those at home, if you haven't watched any other Sector Head Spotlights, they're all in the playlist on YouTube. I uh, encourage you to go watch them out. Last week, we had uh, our head of research and sales, uh, Daryl Jones, on. Uh, great, great background uh, of both Daryl and everything that's going on here at Hedgeye. But more importantly, today, it's all about industrials. How are you? And materials. And materials. And industrials and materials. Uh, how are you doing, Jay? Good. We're, yeah, we're busy uh, heading into earnings season. Uh, we get a lot of uh, conferences this time of year. You get analyst days like FedEx this week. So there's a lot to go through. Awesome. Yeah, so again, for those that may not have uh, watched any prior episodes, the, the general process here is uh, we're going to go through a little bit of Jay's background, get into his actual process and how he uh, formulates, kind of, uh, you know, narrows down all the ideas out there and the, the, the great companies that he could cover. Uh, and then we're going to go uh, touch base on uh, some key themes for 2023. So with that, Jay, uh, I know you've been here for quite some time. And that's one of the beauties of Hedgeye is that uh, the tenure, uh, I think Bloom told me, is uh, seven uh, seven years is the average tenure here at Hedgeye. Uh, and I know you're longer than that, but uh, what's, when did you officially join Hedgeye? I was born at an early age. Yeah. <laughs> I, I joined in 2012, in 2012, uh, and uh, I guess I had been on the buy side a long time. And uh, a friend of mine, a close friend from uh, from college, told me to go and talk to Keith. I went and talked to Keith and he pitched me the idea of remaking the sell side uh, and that we could do a better job. And it sounded like an enormous market that is usually very badly served. If you look at what Adam Jonas puts out in Tesla or whatever, it's just like, oh my God, this passes for research. Um, and the conflicts are deep. Uh, the conflicts remain unresolved very often. Uh, and the goal was to put out a product that uh, would be uh, more sophisticated, actual buy sider, uh, who had covered the space for a dozen years, you know, coming in to uh, provide more sophisticated, more transparent, totally unconflicted work. Yeah. Uh, and that has been very successful. I think it'd be hard to look at the growth of the firm and not conclude that. Agreed. And when you were on the buy side, were you always covering industrials and materials, or was that a pivot that you made here? No, I've, I was. I started out. Um, as a chemist, okay. uh, I'm, a, I'm a lab worker uh, by, by training, academic, uh, but I could program because uh, that's sort of like a standard skill. So I, I got a, a job. I didn't want to work. Uh, I didn't, as it turns out, turns out like working in a lab. Mm -hmm. uh, so I left college uh, and got a job. Uh, and my job was at uh, Brown Brothers Harriman, which is a very wonderful place. Uh, uh, I guess it would be called a white shoe private bank downtown. Mm -hmm with a long history, uh, and I was put into buy-side equity research uh, into a, a quantitative role. Uh, the whole interview process was, uh, I think, consisted of me explaining parts of quantum mechanics to the head of equities and him being interested in it and thinking that I was smart enough to do uh, that, which turned out to be a very easy job. So I wrote a program to do that job for me, and then I didn't have anything to do. So I got apprenticed to the uh, industrials analyst there who had uh, been an industrials analyst for decades mm -hmm. uh, and had a really unique perspective. Like he could talk about, you know, the 1970s like they were yesterday. So when you look at a lot of our material, uh, it has a longer history to it, a longer set of definitions of a cycle, or uh, I think a bit more perspective uh, on how things actually work and play out. Uh, and that in part reflects some of that initial grounding and then the fact that I've just been doing this for more than two decades now and have seen a lot. Um, but yeah, that's how, and then he retired. He was uh, an older uh, guy, and I took his coverage. Uh, and that's how I ended up being an industrials analyst on the buy side at a, uh, and it was also the dot-com crisis, so nobody wanted to spend any money hiring somebody expensive, and I was cheap, and I didn't seem so bad. Uh, so they uh, they gave me the, the job. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you've gone through the the big the, the the bricks boom, I guess, right, of uh, the materials wave there in the, in the 2000s, and... Uh, then kind of, uh, you know, because you've gone through multiple cycles, I guess, is what I'm trying, oh, yeah. is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> no, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, people say consensus is always wrong. That's not, that's not right. Consensus is always, consensus is generally fairly right. And mm -hmm. then you, you know, people say things that seem incredibly naive. Like if everybody in, you know, China bought a washing machine it would require this much steel. And you're like, 
wait, it actually would. Oh my God, people are going to need more iron ore. Uh, you know, you see something like that playing out today in lithium where people are like, well, if everyone bought an electric car, you know, they can't do that. There's not enough lithium. To pay. I mean, you could very small batteries, right? You could do that. Yeah. <laughs> everyone could go four miles and they'd have to recharge. But, uh, but you know, you run, you run out of lithium pretty quickly. So there are things like that uh, that you can see in cycles that are, you mentioned bricks, like that was sort of the big, you know, beginning of, uh, you know, China enters the WTO and that's sort of the defining, all the infrastructure needed to basically supply the fixed asset investment bubble. Yep. Uh, there was an enormous theme, at least on the machinery side. Uh, it also, I think, took away from automation. You saw a lot more manufacturing go to uh, low labor cost regions. You know, every industrial presentation for a long time was just like, yeah, we're going to make that in China and then our margins are going to go up. Right? Uh, and you see some of the unwind of that now. Um, I think I think it is helpful to have been through sort of that that BRICS emergence and uh, what is a reordering of the global uh, system now to 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 know that that actually happened to have lived it to watch it uh, to talk to the people at the time uh, so I think that longer perspective is, is useful. Yep, and so if we go kind of pivot a little bit to your process, um, how has that evolved over time from from kind of buy side to where we are today? And I'm I'm sure it's even involved since you've been at Hedge Eye since 2012. But um, yeah, just kind of curious. Yeah, so I mean, I should our, our process is to define the cycle. Okay. So what we're usually trying to do is understand uh, what drives cyclicality or a secular trend in an industry, or what will feel. I mean, finally, everything is cyclical, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess. But you know. There are true growth industries. We don't have that many of them. Mm -hmm. Like automation might be a true growth industry. Uh, but for the most part, we have cyclicals. So the uh, the industry we usually do uh, in describing process is shipbuilding. It's actually our launch short with Samsung Heavy when, uh, when I introduced process at Hedge Eye in 2012. Because uh, it's a beautiful cycle, right? World War II results in uh, a lot of uh, ship shipping tonnage. It should be a yeah, the, chart uh, for that. General, if you don't uh, mind pulling up slide one, that'd be great. Uh, you know, you see a lot of tonnage added to the global fleet, fleet after World War II, but ships last for 30 years because they're made out of steel and they're in salt water and they rust out and uh, they gradually get replaced. Uh, we call it fleet demographics. So I was, uh, I think Neil um, Howe is an interesting person to work with because there's people <laughs> demographics. It's like, but what if they were ships? I made the idea of like, it's a newborn baby rail car, right? Uh, and it will age, go through its life cycle, buy a house or whatever. Um, but, you know, 30 years later, you get a big replacement cycle because all the ships that came out of the war, they wear out. And that was the 70s. Uh, and then, you know, you have another 30-year uh, cycle of, of those get replaced, uh, peaks out very clearly around 2011, 2012, when we put uh, Samsung Heavy on Best Ideas as a short, and it promptly went up, aggravating the sales team. Uh, but later, I think it's down something like 80% since then. So, it, you know, these are these are longer term calls. Like this isn't, you know, uh, a signaling market microstructure type of approach. This is something that is tangible, really long term. In the case of shipbuilding, mm -hmm. uh, you can know that in uh, whatever it will be in uh, 2045 that you should buy uh, probably Chinese shipbuilders, assuming that we're all still here and there's public equity and Chinese shipbuilders to buy uh, because there'll be another replacement cycle. All of those, uh, you know, the cohort from call it 2002 to 2012, those ships will wear out, they'll be replaced unless we're going to stop shipping things, which is very improbable. Um, and uh, that will be a great long. It'll go up 10x or something like that uh, in, you know, eight years. And that's a perfectly acceptable return. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first part of process. Um, you know, the second part of process is to look at industry structure. Mm -hmm. And something that I just have come away with thinking over time is there are good businesses and there are businesses that are just really hot heart and have a high failure rate, like opening restaurants or truckload carriers, right? Yep. It's another one where you just have, you know, a very hard time historically making high returns on capital. And then there are things like railroads, which are basically lightly regulated monopolies at the moment, right? They have an easy time making more money yep. when they don't have accidents that get press coverage. Um, you know, so I, th I think there are places to, you know, generally, in my experience, it's a lot easier to bet on a good business than a bad business. That doesn't mean that you can't get outlier returns in 90s airlines from peak to trough. It's just, in general, you're going to have an easier time being along good businesses and short bad ones. Your, your hit rate is going to be higher. It's a, you know, it's like, uh, you know, trying to play blackjack with, uh, you know, hitting on an 18. It's mm -hmm. like, 
uh, it's just, it might work. You might get your three, but you probably won't. Right? <laughs> uh, so that's the second part. And then I am, I'm not, I would consider myself like a, a value guy, mm -hmm. not in like a, I buy cheap stocks and that's all you need to do way. But I do think that there is this idea of alpha in the market that's theoretical and uh, a useful way, you know, a useful heuristic, a rule of thumb to think about things. And, you know, if, if you have a company that, um, and I'm not like, you know, a, a value person who thinks that like it's everywhere and always it has to be a value approach, right? Because mm -hmm. I lived through the financial crisis. I saw things trading for, you know, less than liquidation, less than, uh, you know, net nets were, were all around and you would buy them and they would probably go down on you. Uh, so that was a you know humbling moment. Oh my God, it's a net net. This is fantastic, right? Where current assets minus current liabilities exceeds the enterprise value. Um, and there are ways in which, you know, even value can not play out, right? It can be very tricky. Uh, what you think is cheap is cheap for a reason is very often the case. Uh, but I do think that there are, are moments when if you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, valuation anomalies uh, between, for example, A and B shares, right? Uh, two classes of stock. Uh, in the case of VW, I think it's like an amazing example right now where yeah. you have Porsche is trading for, which owns 75% of, or VW owns 75% of Porsche. Porsche is trading for more than that 75% stake is worth, and it's only 11% of VW revenues, right? It's a small part of the total mix, a company that's net cash. Uh, that's, you know, the kind of thing where, like, if you like the auto cycle, mm -hmm. that's an interesting and important thing to observe rather than looking at the valuation and realizing that, oh, whatever you think about the cycle is probably already priced in or whatever, like, you're not that insightful, right? That's, I think, a useful indication as to what the market is expecting. And the parts of my process that have really adapted, um, I mean, we always had a macro context, right? You couldn't have gone through, I was at a long short fund through the financial crisis, and like, you know, we launched in uh, early 08, and it was amazing, right? Like, there's so, like, ball was cheap, there's so many amazing options, and like, why can't everyone see this, this stuff going on? It was very slow to play out. So when people talk about, oh, you know, the market's done with whatever the cycle is, like, I don't know, it took a really long time in 08 to play out. Um, you know, so I think you have to, I was always macro aware, but making it like an explicit part of the process is a relatively, you know, new development. Uh, because I do think that uh, not even just the company performance, but just security selection varies so much based on macro regime, right? That everyone's going to plow into cyclicals last year. Why? Because they have long backlogs, right? Uh, and now they're all going to plow out of them. Why? Because those backlogs are going to go away. I know that from macro, right? I can get a decent macro forecast. Uh, that's, I think, an important perspective advantage in terms of how you position uh, according to sort of the risk factors for uh, the sector. Uh, and then the other thing we've done, and I guess we always look to things like use equipment prices or like higher frequency data sets, uh, you know, before joining Hedgeye, but we have a data collection team here. We have great access to, we have some more money to run these like, surveys than I used to. Uh, so like we run, um, for example, a Tesla survey, uh, which we think we have in the slides, you know, so we can see how the brand is, is, is faring over time, uh, you know, and whether or not people want to buy electric cars. These are important uh, indicators that we can that these aren't company reported data sets. These are things we can do on the data collection side, looking mm -hmm. at, I mean, app data is the most common or credit card data, things like that. Or people, people use, Hedgeye has been, we don't even share all of them, remarkably clever uh, at coming up with alternative data sources that, because you get in the middle of a quarter, right? And your position is, you know, uh, down 4% relative. And you're like, I don't know, what am I doing here? Like, is this just a waste of time or whatever? And if you have, anything that gives you a better than guessing uh, uh, sense of what's going on in terms of the company fundamentals, which are like they see in earnings, that kind of stuff, it can probably improve your odds, right? I, fa I found it very helpful uh, in terms of decision making at moments where there isn't a lot of other clarity or uncertainty. The market's telling you you're wrong. Maybe you are wrong and this data is bad and you should dump it. Uh, or maybe the data is really robust and you should hang in there, right? Like, uh, you know, climb the mountain or whatever you're supposed to do, right? Uh, my, my daughter said climb the mountain do, which I thought was funny. Uh, but, you know, that's the kind of um, uh, process improvement. Those two things, we call it the three things, cycle, 
uh, industry structure valuation plus the two two additional things. Sure, you know, try and make sure you align with macro, especially on the factor front, and uh, and be aware of alternative data sets and build alternative data sets that give you a unique insight into what's actually playing out. Yeah, so if we go back to that slide on Tesla, slide five there, Genron. Can you just walk our listeners through sort of how you review this and, and kind of come, like what kind of conclusion do you, I mean, I think it's pretty clear, but it's just expanding on sort of kind of what this data is and then and sort of the read through. Um, well, you know, there, there are some uh, real truths in that data set, right? That's an incredible amount of money that has gone out into producing uh, that. Those uh, two bar charts. Yeah, I, I'm not going to, you know, but we're talking about like a lot of money that goes into the surveys. Yeah. Uh, and it's pretty high frequent. Like, we do it pretty frequently. But what's nice is we have a consistent data set. So we have a consistent data set about whether or not people want to buy electric vehicles. We mm -hmm. have surveys on that, different brands. People are really only interested in Tesla. And one of the things that's interesting is if you looked in 2018, 19 at the survey data, uh, you know, it's a really good brand. Mm -hmm. it, it has generally fared very, very well, uh, you know, through that period. And it's not surprising that they were able to sell a lot of cars. Um, and then as you get into more recent data, it's not that surprising uh, as you get into 2022 that they have inventory problems, right? That they're not selling as many cars because the brand is more politicized than it used to be. There are, I think the most important dynamic is more alternative vehicles from Mercedes, Porsche, Audi, BMW, mm -hmm. right? You can now go and buy a Rivian or a Lucid or whatever mm -hmm. it is. There are a lot more options whereas in 2019, there were very few plausible electric cars that you could buy that were like you buy an uh, bold an I pace, and then I struggle. <laughs> like I can't remember the other ones. Um, oh, Leaf. Uh, I can actually come up with them if you give me. That, but it's not really very important. Um, so you know, I think that that tells a story that confirms it provides a bit of quantification of. Um, what you would expect to see in terms of competitive and industry dynamics, as well as some of, um, you know, some of the other issues around the brand. Yeah, makes sense. And, and yeah, I mean, as you pointed out, it, it goes from kind of a, a top quartile type brand awareness and, and be, to, you know, bottom third, basically. Um, yeah, and, and, and just to be clear, like 38 is still a very, very robust still a number. Very good brand, uh, yeah. you know, and that's something if we're bearish on Tesla that we need to hear. You know, that's something that we need to look at and be like, okay, even though this guy has done all this stuff and there's these great competing vehicles and there's these other factors like the subs that he went away for a while, like yep. still did pretty well. Like it's still, you know, yep. uh, it's still, and that, that's an important, uh, it, all the data should not point in, uh, in one direction. If that were at zero, and you know, 100% negative responses, and inventory. They weren't selling. I mean, we wouldn't be selling any vehicles, and uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation because the stock wouldn't be there. It wouldn't be topical, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so there's always going to be good things and bad things, confirming evidence, disconfirming evidence. The most important thing is to focus a lot on the disconfirming evidence. Yeah, and so if we just pivot a little bit to kind of, kind of the outlook for 2023, uh, you have a great slide here, slide four, Genron, about uh, how industrials follow the Fed higher and yes. lower. Uh, so I think that's a, a you know very topical, obviously, with uh, the Fed and and what they're doing with rates, and certainly you know our view here at Hedgeye, which would be you know higher for longer in terms of the the the, the uh, you know the front end of the curve. So so the two year is a good proxy for that, um, but. Uh, yeah, just, you know, if you don't mind running through, uh, you know, what, what you're seeing there inside of the industrials. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, so what's interesting is through 2022, where you saw a lot of what we call the profitless growth names, the mm -hmm. powers, the lucids or whatever, yeah, underperform. Fair. You saw the John Deere's and Caterpillars, the great Caterpillars, the best ideas long, you know, heading into 2022, right? We had Packard, we had a lot of these um, uh, machinery names, uh, the true cyclicals uh, of the sector as longs last year. I mean, they're sure they're high-quality companies or whatever, yep. Dow components, whatever people say about them. But that wasn't why. It's these are names that work as the Fed tightens. Because why is the Fed tightening? Why? Because there's too much inflation. There's too much demand. Capacity utilization is too high. Deer is earning too much money, right? That's basically what that means. And they're going to continue to tighten until that stops, right? So, they're, uh, so typically, uh, you know, when the Fed is tightening, cyclicals outperform. Uh, and then you hear, like, a lot of investors, you know, 
uh, even on the institutional level, when the Fed pivots, you know, these names are really going to be great to be long. You're like, no, no, when the Fed pivots, that means that there's disinflation, factories aren't full, there are too many employees, and these are typically names that will then follow the Fed in terms of cutting back down, right? Mm -hmm. So, believe it or not, cyclicals don't love Fed-induced recessions. Shocking. Um, and that is, you know, I think an important macro framework. So, when we talk, we've recent, only recently, we did a machinery deck literally two, two, 10 days ago, mm -hmm. where we, you know, moved gear up to our top short. Um, we've added all the steel codes as, uh, as best idea shorts in part, because we are getting to the, it can stay high and these can start to underperform. And it can take a long time for them to actually reprice down. Like, the, you know, uh, I'm not sure we're going through 08 again. I mean, that's a, uh, you know, it's always a, a mistake, I think, to, to create market analogies. Every market is its own beast. But there are parts that certainly rhyme, as I was sitting through March uh, watching banks fail, right? Like, that was very, uh, uh, I don't know whether you remember, like, yeah. the, I'm sure you do. Uh, Bear Stearns, I had interviewed a Bear Stearns not that, but like, like three months further, I was like, oh, Yes, I'm glad I passed on that job. Uh, you know, it's true though. Uh, my wife is angry because so you know more money or whatever. Right. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think it would have been fine. I think I would have gotten to go to J.P. Morgan, uh, but uh, I would suspect. I would. I would like to think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, maybe not. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Uh, no, but it's a good segue in terms of. Uh, and you were on a, a Spaces with me on Twitter. Uh, a week and a half ago, uh, a week ago, uh, Tuesday. It seems like a sorry. Two weeks ago, it was two weeks ago. Apologies, <laughs> before your it was two weeks ago. But it doesn't matter. Point is, is that you were talking about kind of like well, one we can get into the steals, but the other component too, in terms of just to, to finish off this thought on industrials and the cycle, um, because you just made this comment about backlogs and, and how you know the backlog had been strong and they're and they're working through that. Uh, but for those that maybe didn't, uh, you know, uh, tune into our spaces, uh, do you mind just walking them through how that backlog cycle cycles? Uh, yes. In terms of what we are seeing today and and how it's pivoted from 2022 to kind of like Q1 here in in 2023. No, it's it's actually been a really unusual cycle uh, in manufacturing because it's very rare that you can't go out and buy as many cars as you want off a Ford lot as, mm -hmm. at any time, right? Uh, and supply chain difficulties really did. Um, undersupply a lot of markets uh, and orders for industrial goods really did accumulate uh, and that is um, that that is an unusual dynamic right and in general uh, cyclicals trade on orders not revenues not earnings like I don't care what any of these guys are going to report in terms of EPS I'm going to look at the backlog and I'm going to take you know it's going to be revenues plus or minus the change in backlog Mm -hmm. Right, that's going to be your implied orders, uh, and if that's above sales, then sales are increasing, and if orders are below sales, then sales are decreasing, and that's your book to bill. And uh, that's what that's what counts at the end of the day for most cyclicals. Order and the outlook for orders is, is what matters. So, uh, but you end up occasionally where the line is so long that people don't focus as much on orders. They focus, oh, well, I mean, they're sold out for twenty twenty four. I mean. Finally, if you're sold out to 2030, like, yeah, I guess your orders don't matter, right? Like, it doesn't matter. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, what happens, so you can be sort of bullish into a slowing order environment in 2020, uh, and then know that at some point, you're going to start to eat into backlog, order backlogs in a way that matters. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's pivoted here uh, and, and will matter, I think, going forward through uh, backlogs peaked out on ISM in October, or I guess they turned negative, which technically means they peaked up in October of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, so you should start to see negative order trends. You started to see uh, a negative book to bill, like a caterpillar book to bill below one uh, in the fourth quarter, but those will turn much more averse in the first quarter numbers. And that's one of the reasons to be cautious on cyclicals through, uh, through this quarter and basically now. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I haven't gone through uh, financials on the industrial side in quite a while, but the book to build number, is that something that they report or is that something that you calculate? No, not everybody discloses order okay. backlog, okay. Uh, but or you, they, usually they give you a backlog of order and, and you can just calculate it very quickly. Cool. Um, and that's uh, that's important. Cool. Yeah, so uh, for those at home, book to bill, critical piece. Uh, if you didn't, if you didn't catch that little, uh, it's called active listening, and uh, that's a really be, uh, important piece here. So if you're kind of tracking this at home, book to bill uh, is a great, great uh, you know metric to 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 track. And if, if there's one other like thing that I'd like actively listening people, this the Caterpillar reported its highest margin 
ever. Right. Uh, not quite a century old company in the fourth quarter of this year, mm -hmm. uh, of 2022, so last year. Yeah. Fourth quarter, uh, cyclicals are reporting all time highs in margins. Yep. Are not that's not bullish. That's usually you want to buy cyclicals when they're ideally at an infinite PE because they're losing money or an uh, undefined PE, uh, and you want to sell them when they're at low PEs and you know reporting peak margins. So uh, I think the risk, like the up cycle, is very powerful because of the supply chain difficulties. Another dynamic uh, which we could talk about is uh, the narrowing of competitive geography, which contributes to those high margins, which I think is um, slide five or six. Uh, that we had uh, up there. I don't know if that's useful. Um, there, that's a good one. Yep. Uh, so, you know, what's interesting about these markets uh, for, for industrial products is very often they're global, right? So cement is like the classic local market. Like nobody's importing cement from like, you know, Nigeria to the U.S. because it's just, it would cost a fortune. Mm -hmm. So typically, you know, we think about cement as having a 50-mile geographic competitive range, right? Like. Okay. And if somebody's 200 miles away, you're not competing with them in cement because it's just too heavy to too cheap to ship around. Hmm. Uh, I mean, there may be exceptions that we can put it on boats and things, but for the most part, if it's not on a boat, it's pretty narrow. Uh, when you have shipping rates that blow out like they did during the fine, uh, during the uh, the COVID period where hmm. you had snarling at ports and intermodal terminals and things like that, the price of shipping blows out and the competitive geography for all industries narrowed enormously. So instead of steel, you know, competing as a global industry, suddenly it was competing as a domestic industry. And then everyone starts talking about reshoring because of course people are ordering domestically. You couldn't possibly 12, pay $1,200 to, you know, for a container to ship a steel toaster to the U S like it would just be too expensive. Uh, and you see that for steel very clearly in, in a number, you saw it in 08 when Baltic dry went nuts, uh, mm -hmm. you saw steel profits and steel, Stocks increased quite a bit. The dynamics are a little different uh, in this particular cycle because uh, it was really a supply chain difficulty in addition to shipping. Uh, and there is a reshoring story that gets going, part of which is very true, right? Part of reshoring started back in 14, 15, when one, it just became more expensive to produce in what were formerly low labor cost areas. And two, uh, uh, because I think uh, automation, a lot of technology has made it more attractive to produce in, and tax policy and other policies made it more attractive to produce uh, in Western Europe and the U.S. Uh, so the other part of it is just, you know, it became too expensive to import things, so people bought things locally. That has since reversed. So a lot of those names, I think, are the most vulnerable, the ones that were, uh, like steel, subject to reduced international competition because shipping rates were too high and are now facing a renewed surge of, you know, cheaper overseas products. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. I think from a materials and industrial s uh, standpoint, I know uh, late cycle pricing is what they have been reporting. And we certainly believe that that's uh, going to be pivoting here. And, and one reason why uh, both materials, XLB, and industrials are uh, on the short list for, for Keith and the signal in terms of uh, on the short side. However, if you listen to the call this morning, you, my friend, were a lucky guy because you had three of his top seven signal, you know, top longs on the from a signal strength standpoint. So, uh, don't just think Hedge Eye here is is uh, you know always bearish, right? It's we've got great longs and shorts. Um, and if you didn't get a chance to watch that call, or sorry, listen to the call this morning. Uh, this would be uh, April, what are we, the April 6th. Um, I would really encourage you to do so because it was a great, uh, you, you and Keith had a fantastic conversation this morning on uh, both uh, some, yeah, on both, both of your longs and then also on some of the shorts too. Yeah, one of the problems with covering industrials is we talk about these machinery names and that's what people think about when they think about industrials. But in fact, the real role of industrials in the S&P is to accommodate whatever doesn't fit into another sector. So <laughs> if it doesn't make sense in, you know, healthcare, it's probably an industrial. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. So you end up with uh, everything from the transports, airlines, railroads, the uh, manufacturing companies, business services, uniform services, right? Like any of these, uh, for a while we had food service, which I think Aramark has now been moved to Howard's coverage. Mm. Uh, but it is a uh, amazingly diverse company, uh, sector, right? So mm. waste management is an industrial, right? Like, I guess it makes sense, but if you think about the dynamics of what makes a truckload carrier work, right? It's a very, it's very different from what makes um, 
uh, a caterpillar work or what makes uh, an airline work mm -hmm. or uh, a defense contractor, which we also have. Right? These are all very different uh, industries. They all also tend to have finance subsidiaries. So uh, every industrials person is basically a generalist, right? There are some things I don't know about, but mostly we have to get into a lot of very niche industries uh, to understand them. Yeah. Awesome. Well, with that, I you know, just want to really thank you for your time today. It was a great conversation. Uh, this, you know, we could be doing this for hours, to be perfectly frank with you, Jay. But uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we will see you uh, soon.